Hello, everyone, and welcome to the King's Chapel. We see you through the lens of a camera that's uh, filming, and we're so grateful for you, and we miss you. This is a strange beyond explanation. It's the first in my life and yours. Uh, I, uh, however, believe that there is a custodian over all this that cares for his people with gentility and love, and he uses these things for a greater purpose than we can think our way through. The secret things are in God's hands, ultimately. I want to read you something to start this morning, and what I want to talk about is the reality of Jesus Christ and our need for everything he has for us. One man wrote this, there are depths in the ocean, I am told, which no tempest ever stirs. They are beyond the reach of all storms which sweep and agitate the surface of the sea. And there are heights in the blue sky above which no cloud ever ascends, where no tempest ever rages, for all is perpetual sunshine and nothing exists to disturb the deep serene. Each of these is an emblem of the soul which Jesus visits, to whom he speaks peace, whose fear he dispels, and was and is a lamp of hope he trims. You are his lamps. You are the light of the world. Jesus Christ in our narrative has not been discovered except perhaps by, by a few people. Two men who walked with him on a road to the town of Emmaus spoke to him and he opened up for them the scriptures and the, the word of God says their hearts burned within them. They were being changed and transformed because they were learning how the Old Testament had spoken about the coming of the Messiah. How everything in it pointed to his coming. And now we find a larger group of disciples awaiting they know not what. Luke 24, 36, as they were talking about these things, the empty tomb, the women, the people who had seen the Lord Jesus in some resurrected form, as they were talking about these things, and perhaps, if you'll remember, after they were suffering from their own cowardice, from their own failure, these are the people Jesus loves and comes to and frankly uses for ministry. They're torn up. They're devastated over their denial of the Lord at the very moment that he needed them, of their cowardice and not protecting him, of their lack, their sin, their lostness in a certain sense without him. What will they do? Where will they go? Where will their sustenance come from? Where will their livings come from? What will happen to them? Because their world has turned topsy-turvy. Now, as they were talking about these things, and at their very worst now, Jesus himself stood among them and rebuked them? No. He says, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? You can imagine this. Each one of us has seen that car coming. It's on a dead collision course with our car, and we can't stop it. It just happens. I had one drive my car into, towards a truck, in order to destroy my life. I saw one time a giant truck looming in front of me and a group of kids when I was a teenager, and it looked like our heads were going to be cut off as we ran into the side of the truck at high speed, shocked, startled. And Jesus comes to a group he could have rebuked and reproved. He could have acted on in a very negative way and goes, shalom, peace be with you. This is a good time for peace, 
But in spite of what he says to them, they're startled and frightened and they think they're seeing something that's not real, an apparition, some kind of ghost or spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart in any time, in any pressured time, at any pressured moment when things seem to be going south? We can tend to be filled with fear and doubt. There was a a doctor whose name was John Duncan, oft times the obsessive compulsive personality, that person that dots all his I's and crosses all his T's. He's very perfectionistic, and that very perfectionism, the thing that makes him successful in law or medicine, also makes him a nervous wreck because none of us is perfect. In some sense, we're all broken. That is a reality. That is not an apparition. But Dr. Duncan took this darkness to a bit of an extreme. There's a touching passage which relates how much he suffered from religious melancholy. He used the the gospel of Christ to whip himself with the tentacles of the law. Well, the law is led to lead us to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It says how much he suffered from religious melancholy. His mental struggles were often very distressing, casting a shadow over his whole life and work. On one occasion, he went to his college class where he was teaching in a state of extreme dejection. During the opening prayer, however, the cloud passed away. His eye brightened, his features relaxed. And before beginning his lecture, he said, with pathos, with pathetic sympathy. Dear young gentlemen, I just got a glimpse of Jesus. A glimpse of Jesus. A glimpse for the Christian, for the believer, of reality. A glimpse of that which for us is concrete by faith. By faith we see him. By faith we hear him. By faith we get a glimpse of him. And that's more than enough. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the sky becomes clear. The ocean is still. And they not only see him in this room, they hear him. And he invites them to touch him. See my hands and feet that it is I myself, you'll remember Thomas, reaching uh, or being tempted by the Lord in, in essence to reach and touch him, to do whatever he needs to do to prove the reality of Jesus Christ. Jesus is real. All else in a sense may be an apparition, but he is real. That's what the gospel declares. God has come in him, bringing his world broken and storm-tossed to himself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still believed, disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything to eat? He's going to show them the reality. Jesus shows His corporeal nature, big word meaning he's going to show that he is alive. He is in a fully resurrected body. He has the nail prints in his hands and in his feet for any to see or to feel. And he can eat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Jesus is real. There's a film that talks about reality versus illusion. Reality versus an illusion. It's called, the film is called A Beautiful Mind. And there's a scene in the film that is very similar to the situation in this room. John Nash is a brilliant mathematician who, in the complexity of his mental structure, struggles with depression, struggles with confusion, And when your husband struggles, the wife struggles. And the wife was a brilliant woman. But living with John became almost untenable. And there was such brokenness in his mind as he saw things that did not exist. She wanted to help him in some way out of love rather than leave him to himself and his own very confused devices. 
There's this one scene where she says, when he is struggling with what is real around him, he sees things, he sees confusions and apparitions. Do you want to know what's real, she says? Her hand goes to his face. This. And she touches concretely his face and then takes his hand and puts it to her face and says this. And then he takes that hand and puts it to her own heart. And she says, this is real. She says, maybe the part that knows the waking from the dream isn't here, speaking to John, pointing to his head, to his brain that is struggling. Maybe the place that knows reality is here. Here, pointing at his heart. Jesus Christ is reality to such a degree that he eats in front of these boys that he's commissioning and preparing for the replication of his own ministry. They are his disciples and they're going to be disciplined. The wife of John Nash says, I need to believe that something extraordinary is possible. That his head, which is confused, can be replaced by that which is real. His heart and his hands and his face, concrete reality. And what the gospel declares is Jesus is that reality. He is not an apparition, as he says. He is not a spirit. He is somewhat real. Someone who is real. And when we talk to him and walk with him, he makes everything new. He speaks peace to the soul that finds him real. Paul had every reason to be fearful. The Apostle Paul. He had been filled and clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. He had been changed from the inside out. He had seen the Lord Jesus. But life came at him in vicious torment as people both received the good news of Jesus Christ and also rejected it for the most self-centered and insane reasons. And he says out of the desperate pool that he had to tread in in the hour that he lived, he said to his disciples, in the same way Jesus says, peace be to you, he says, be not anxious in anything but in everything with prayer and supplication. Make your requests known to God and the peace of Christ will rule in your hearts. That is what is real. Let me tell you something. That is what is real. Not government systems, not coronavirus. What is real at the end of the day is we can trust the Jesus who walks with us and who is resurrected to care for us, to make life rich and abundant for the believer. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, that's the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch and the prophets and the Psalms, those are the three divisions of the Old Testament, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Why did he want to have them understand the scriptures? Because he was commissioning them. And to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, they would have to know Israel's book, the Bible. That was the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. The songs of David and others. Let me read you one of them, and this is why Jesus is so real. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Raise your hand when you know who is talking in this thing. It was written by David. David was a psalm singer. He was also a prophet. He was a king as well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? In the King James, they used to say the roaring. The, the person in this voice is so dry 
that he cannot make human sounds. He roars like some wounded animal. Oh my God, I cry for day by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy. Here's how you remind yourself. Here's how you break through to reality. You remind yourself that there is a God, that he is holy, and that he loves you in the midst of whatever your trial is. This is a picture of Jesus Christ hanging on the cross written 1,000 years prior to his concrete coming. The Bible is a real book. When it speaks of piercings in bodies, it is invariably speaking about Jesus Christ and his death on a cross for the sins of man. Let me continue. Yet you are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm. And not a man scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me and they make mouths at me. They wag their, their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust in you, trust you at my mother's breast. I am yours, Lord. I am your son. I am your child. You have trusted me with everything, and I have trusted you. And even in this horrifying extremity, when I am a worm, that is a, a, an animal uh, with, without any bones, when he looked on the cross as if he'd been taken apart, his body was disjointed, modern day uh, crime scene investigators say that his shoulders were out of joint. Everything was. And the fluid was running out of his body, dripping out of his body as he had been beaten on his back, pierced, abused, crowned with thorns, probably an inch, inch and a half, two inches long. If you've been to Israel, you'll know what I'm talking about. On you, he turns again in extremity to reality, to the God that created everything and was working even this out, even the worst that life could throw, for good. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help, no man to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surrounded me. This is evil doers. These are men that are laughing, Roman soldiers, prophets, priests, all these people are around him, surrounding him, surrounded by false ideas, surrounded by the apparitions of their own mind. What are those apparitions? Fear, fear of the loss of position, possession, passions, loss of everything, irrational. He calls them horned beasts attempting to attack him. Bashan simply means a very prosperous community where these beasts grew giant. They opened wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Question. Why does Jesus teach his disciple these kinds of passages? So that he can go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and say, I am the designated Messiah. I am the one who was to come. He goes into a synagogue at one point and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to set the captive free. He said, This day these things have, have been done and accomplished in your hearing. He is saying that the Old Testament is pointing to him as the anointed one of God, as God's very son. And finally, as you and I know, the secret and the reality, as God of gods. Dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat off of me. They divide their garments among them, those Romans. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, he intercedes. When you're in trouble, when everything's going wrong, what does he do? Does he condemn God? Does he blame God as so many do? Oh, no, no, no. He sees a greater purpose in his suffering. What was it? Let me tell you the end from the beginning. His greater purpose was this. 
that the world might be saved through him. The Bible has always spoken of him. Adam and Eve were covered with, in a sense, the coverings made from the shedding of blood of animals. That's in Genesis. In Exodus, the people had the death angel pass over them because of the blood shed as they gave up lambs uh, in, 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 in innocent and perfect lambs to let their blood cover their sins. Leviticus speaks of sacrifice endlessly. Every sacrifice somehow tied to a need for man to be purified, to be helped, but man keeps stumbling and stumbling and stumbling, even as these disciples did. They've fallen and they have no one to help, and it seems that way with the very Son of God as he's counting his bones. Save me, he says. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of wild oxen. God is doing a rescue mission. But not so much for his son at this moment. For the whole world. When I was a child, I heard, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. I thought, why would God, if he's love, let his son go through this? Well, if you're not a Christian, I'll tell you why. Because he loved you so much. You have done wrong and God is just and must punish evil, wickedness, and sin. But he is also love and doesn't want to punish sin. And so he pours his justice and wrath down on himself, on Calvary's tree, on his son, flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones. In verse 22, it says, ah, here's the end. Here's the happy ending. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you, you who fear the Lord. Praise him, all you offspring of Jacob. Glorify stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. I want to reach my people. God has done a mighty thing here, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard my cry. He, when, I, when he cried to him, for you, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. To this moment, his praise is lifted up in America. Some one billion people have come to Christ. Would that there be four billion more that will step out of the illusion that sin will grant you goodness and kindness and win the day for you and into the reality that this is real, that his hands are real, that his feet and the stabbing in his side were real. Real in what sense? Real in the sense that he has pictured eternally the greatest love of all in his sacrifice for you. He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He has paid the price for all your sins for all time in this passage. And in verse 30, it says this, posterity, that's you and me, I hope, shall serve Him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim His righteousness to a people yet unborn that He has done it. He has done it. Not my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But ultimately, if I had known as a child the whole song, resurrection power, life from the dead, peace be unto you. He said to them, speaking of Jesus, and get back to Luke, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance, that is turning from sin to Christ, to forgiveness, to grace, to his life. He loves you and gave himself for you. No one, this is real, loves you like Jesus. No one. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. There's a gift coming to you. It is the very life and breath of God. It is the wind of the Holy Spirit. You are going to be clothed with power from on high. Power for the Pentecostal purpose. That means that the whole world might know Jesus Christ. You can argue with people forever. But if you pray for them and they see God's hand, if you are empowered in such a way as, as, as to show you're totally 
different in the best sense. Loving, kind, resourceful. The Christian's worst enemy is the non-spirit-led Christian. The person that mouths certain phrases and is very religious, but contemptuous in his real behavior. Jesus wants to do so much more than that. He wants to come in us and work his life out through us. Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as as far as as, uh, this passage indicates. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continually in the temple blessing God. One man said this, if I may conclude, we are soldiers of Jesus Christ. Now, that which nerves the soldier's arm and strengthens his heart as he goes forth to battle is not so much the multitude of the army of which he forms a part or the character as it is the character of the chief whom he is following. It is related that in one of the Duke of Wellington's battles, a portion of the army was giving way under the charge of the enemy when he wrote into the midst of them. A soldier called out in ecstasy, there's the Duke, God bless him. I'd rather see his face than a whole brigade. And these words, turning all eyes to their chief, so reassured his comrades that they repulsed the folk. They repulsed the enemy. They felt he is beside us who has never been defeated yet and who will not be defeated now. A military friend with whom I conversed and a gentleman named Tate wrote this on the subject, said that, though he had never heard the anecdote, he could well conceive it to be true. The presence of the distinguished general, he added, was at any time worth 5,000 men. You and Jesus are a vital force. This is real. Father, thank you for this congregation viewing this on camera. Bless them, save them, touch them, encourage them, and right now as they're with you, help them cry out to be clothed with power from on high. Clothed with your spirit. It's the simplest prayer in the world. Lord, give me everything I need for ministry and work your gifts through me that I might bring you glory and be saved and filled. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.